Travis D. Wayne Robertson was a 23-year-old from Salome Springs, Arkansas. He had four sisters and loved to play pranks on them. On February 28, 2006, he attended Mardi Gras in Fayetteville with friends, including the boyfriend of one of his sisters. Travis felt sick and decided to go back to the car. When the others reached the vehicle an hour later, Travis was gone. He was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. I do unfound, I realize it's not always about discovering all we can know about a disappearance. Yes, the people who I interview know the most. And yes, oftentimes they know even more than the police do. Even though, as in the disappearances of Laura Bible and Ashley Freeman, we found out that they'd been withholding the car insurance card information since the beginning. I'm not even sure Laureen Bible knew about that. But myself and Unfound's guests do our best to get as much data out there so you, the public, can offer your opinions and knowledge. Because I'm of the belief that in pursuits such as this, more heads are better than two or one. And you, the listeners, never cease to amaze me with your insights and the information you discover on your own. But to continue my original thought, sometimes Unfound also concerns figuring out what we don't know. What I mean are those details that should be known, but aren't. Because even I take things for granted that are true. Then when I really start talking to a guest, I discover there is a lot of wiggle room for other possibilities. Travis Robertson's case is one of those. From the outside, this seems like the public probably knows everything it can know. But what I think you will hear in the interview is that many things are up in the air. The things we think we know aren't exactly solid, and maybe we can point our guest in some directions and help her fill in the blanks. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Goodsight, charlieproject.org. For Travis Robertson, his early 20s were a difficult time. Despite going through his teen years with few health problems, he developed epilepsy. On top of that, he had gotten mixed up in the drug trade, both taking them and transporting them. But his family was hopeful that 2006 would be the year Travis worked his way out of these problems. On February 28, 2006, he traveled from Salome Springs, Arkansas, to downtown Fayetteville to attend a huge Mardi Gras festival. He went there with his sister's boyfriend, Steve, Steve's friend, John, and two girls and another guy. Travis was interested in one of the girls, but she chose to bring this other guy instead. Well, at this big party, with the streets packed with revelers, Steve and Travis got separated from the group. They entered a bar to have a beer. While there, according to Steve, Travis ran into an Hispanic man he seemed to know. They talked, although Steve didn't hear the conversation. After a minute or so, the man left. After this, Travis said he was getting sick and he decided to go back to the car. Steve said he would find the others and meet Travis back at the vehicle in an hour. When Steve and the rest of the group got to the car, Travis was nowhere to be found. There were no signs he ever reached the car at all. He was never seen again. The following issues have complicated the investigation of Travis's disappearance. A series of mistakes and miscommunications between Salome Springs and Fayetteville as to which department should be responsible. Travis's claim that in March 2016 he was due to testify against a well-known drug trafficker that he used to work for but there doesn't seem to be any documentation to that fact. And a phone call after Travis disappeared from a woman who claims he was calling her and she was trying to get him to stop. Travis's family believes Travis could be the victim of foul play. His case remains unsolved. The interview for this episode is with Sonia Robertson, Travis's youngest sister. Unfound News. I got a shipment of Volume 3 paperbacks from Amazon a couple days ago. If you'd like one, signed by yours truly, please contact me personally so we can make that happen. 
The guests for the cases covered in Volume 3 will be getting their copies for free, just like what was done for Volumes 1 and 2. By the way, I've also completed creating the cover for Volume 4. I posted it on Facebook and Instagram. Have you seen it? Next, myself and my business partner Shay continue to work on contacting media companies. She's working her way up the list, starting with smaller media markets. This is something that I knew from the beginning was going to take time, mainly because I don't believe it's ever been done before. I continue to be confident this is going to be an excellent way to get the word out about the cases, Unfound Covers. Finally, I hope all the listeners who attended CrimeCon had a great time. I saw the pictures and videos from the convention. I know, I know, I should have gone. But it's really not my thing. I would love to meet all of you sometime, but under different kinds of circumstances. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound is on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Podomatic, Stitcher, Podbean, and Spotify. In particular, please join us on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern for the Unfound Facebook Live Video Show, which is hosted on the Unfound Podcast page, not in the private group. The email address, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. The website, unfoundpodcast.com. Please check out the secret Stephen Kocher episode. The website at tribtotalmedia, triblive.com forward slash news forward slash unfound. Unfound has Patreon and PayPal accounts. Your contributions provide for many of the items guests have received so far. I cannot thank all of Unfound supporters enough. Unfound Merchandise, Volumes 1, 2, and 3 on Amazon in both paperback and ebook form. Let's try to work on getting some great reviews for Volume 2. If you've bought it, please give it a nice review. The playing cards, go to makeplayingcards.com forward slash sell forward slash unfound podcast. Search for almost all of Unfound's cases at unfound-podcast.myshopify.com. This includes the flagship t-shirt, The First Year Cases, that has a collage of everyone from Suzanne Lyle to Jennifer Wilkerson in it. Please check that out. And please mention Unfound on all True Crime Facebook pages and other websites and forums. Thank you. I'm so fortunate to have on this episode of Unfound the sister of Travis Robertson, Sonia Robertson. Sonia, welcome to Unfound. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Let's start here. Tell the listeners uh, a little bit about Travis. First of all, how many brothers and sisters do you and Travis have? Um, three sisters and one brother, so that makes uh, five total, including me. Wow, so Travis is your only brother? Yes. Wow, he was he grew up with a bunch of sisters. How did he handle that? Um, he teased us a lot and always did pranks, typical big brother things. Yeah, and, and so if he was the only uh, boy, was he like the oldest or next oldest? What was he? Uh, he was the next to oldest. My sister Misty was the oldest. And then it was Misty, Travis, Shanda, Keisha, and then me. Okay, and so you're the youngest. You're the baby. I I am the youngest. Okay, and how many, what's the age difference between, what was the age difference maybe between you and Travis? Um, We were uh, five years apart. Five years apart. So that's not too big of a span, I guess. No. Uh, he was 15, you're 10, he's 20, uh, you were 15. Okay. And what was the Robertson house like? What was he into? And did he look over you, you, uh, all of you, both you and your sisters? Was he protective? What was he like? Uh, he was protective. I mean, um, if there was someone that he didn't like, he would let us know and he would actually defend us in school a lot of the time. Um, like in school, our motto was you mess with one Robertson, you mess with all. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of a, big time big brother thing um i mean he was always just joking around doing pranks on us and then he eventually got really big into the country music and he would always do these little impressions of all these famous people so growing up with him was actually pretty fun i mean you always seem to either get mad at him or laugh at him every single day Mm -hmm. for something that he did was it were his impersonations pretty good yeah, they're pretty good. <laughs> Were they? Okay. 
I mean, okay. Somebody, yeah. some people really, um, you know, have a talent for that. I do not, but a lot of people, some people do. Maybe he was one of them. He was definitely one of them for sure. Okay. Country music. You like to impersonate country music stars. That's pretty funny. Okay. Yeah. Um, what was he into? So I, did he like country music or what was he in? What kind of music did he like? For the longest time, he was more into like the classic rock and um, Pink Floyd and Def Leppard and all that stuff. And then once he got um, out of school, he started getting really liking country music and Garth Brooks and George Trey, Toby Keith, um, that sort of thing. All right. Well, I would have gone along with the Def Leppard stuff, but besides that, probably not. <laughs> I'm not a country music fan. Okay. What did he do in school? Was he into any sports? Did he have any hobbies like fishing, hunting there in Arkansas? Um, no, not really. I mean, he was more focused on like just listening to music, and um, he actually did like to explore outdoors a lot of the times. And he did one time catch me a chipmunk, and so he made me a cage and stuff for it. So huh. he he really liked the outdoors a lot, and um, looking for arrowheads and that sort of thing with um with um our parents. Okay, but we do have to talk about this because this is going to be, um, you know, a decent part of this conversation about Travis's mm -hmm. disappearance. Uh, when do you first remember, once again, you were five years uh, younger than, than Travis, that maybe you thought that maybe he had gotten into drugs or something like that? When, when did you... Um, I would probably say, um... Probably after high school, I would think. I'm what do you think happened after there? High school. What, 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 do you, what do you think? I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that someone's like, hey, you want to try this or something? And he either that or he just or he just said, hey, can I try that? One of the two. Um, I wasn't with him at all when he first. I was hardly ever around him when he was doing it because I didn't agree with it. Yeah. And I was like, that's not the kind of life that I want to be around I didn't want to be around that kind of environment so I know it started with the weed and then it kind of progressed to meth and so it kind of got worse after he started smoking the weed and then once he got into the meth it just kind of went downhill from there okay and we maybe we need to remind the listeners that when he disappeared um he was 23 years old he was going to be 24 yeah, that he year 23. he was 23 yeah. okay so he maybe was 18 when he graduated, and then he got into this. And uh, once again, if you don't know Sonia, that you know we make no judgments here on Unfound. I don't, you know, I personally don't believe people should do drugs. I think that it, obviously it hurts families, etc. But if you want to find your brother, myself and the listeners, we want to help you. Okay, we make no judgments regarding whatever he was doing in his life. Okay, the only reason we talk about it is because it may be an element that maybe led to his disappearance. Okay. Oh, for sure. Yeah. All right, just so you understand that. Um, mm -hmm. Something else uh, that uh, came about, I think, after high school that maybe had something to do with his getting into drugs was uh, he suffered from epilepsy. What can you tell the listeners about that? That, um, I know the very first one he had, um, was of course after high school and he was in the middle of playing a Nintendo game and then all of a sudden he just kind of started shaking and no one knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. And then of course her mom suffered from epilepsy, epilepsy as well. So she knew, you know, and so, but it kind of progressed. They started off really slow and they kind of progressed, um, like he would have one like every couple of days or couple of weeks or something like that and then once he got on his medication it kind of slowed the process down but the good thing is he usually knew whenever he was fixing to seize so if he knew that he was going to seize he would try to sit down and relax or take his medication or something like that so you were around him some of these times that he had these seizures um i was a couple of the times i was uh i've never Suffered from epilepsy. Uh, I don't think I personally know anybody. Uh, I think we had at least one other case where we had somebody who disappeared who suffered from it. But what? How would he explain it after he came out of the seizure? Did he lose um, sense of reality? Does he remember it happening? What would he tell you about he, these epileptic seizures? Seizures. He would basically just like wake up and just be so confused and not know what happened or anything and. 
um, he, you'd basically just have to tell him, hey, you had a seizure, you know, and he'd like, and he wouldn't even recall any of it. And so it's kind of like, I guess, like basically kind of like a blackout. Like mm-hmm. he doesn't remember before it, like going into it, he didn't remember during, or, and it took him a while to realize what was going on after he woke up too. Mm-hmm. So it was more of a, basically like a full on blackout, kind of like not knowing what was going on at all. Did he ever, to your knowledge, ever hurt himself during any of these seizures? Could they be violent where he would, to the point of him hurting himself? Um, yeah, he's actually hurt. He actually hurt himself a couple of times. I mean, more like bumps and bruises, but nothing too terrible as far as like no broken bones or anything like that. As it's mostly knots and bruises and things like that. Did he um, have a driver's license? Did any of these uh, occurrences ever happen while driving a car? Um, not during driving. He never had one, to my knowledge. I mean, he didn't really like to drive that much because he didn't want to go into a seizure oh. while driving. Okay. Okay, so he shied away from it because he knew that could happen while he was driving. Yeah. Okay. What do you think brought these uh, seizures on? I honestly think uh, the drugs are what brought it on. I mean, because from what I've heard from, from doctors, that is one of the big things, too, is depending on what kind of drugs you're doing, it can cause that. And I, and I was told that meth is a big one that can actually cause epileptic in people. Okay. And would you say that at the time of his disappearance, do you think that he was taking his medication as he should, or was he known to kind of go a little lax on that? No, I mean, he was taking it like he should. Usually it was like once a day or unless he felt like he was going to go into a um, seizure, he would take one. But um, I think he was actually taking him pretty regularly like he should. He wasn't slowing on him or anything like that. Okay. Do you think that he, it's, I mean, of course he has these first seizures, maybe doesn't want know what's going on, goes to see a doctor. But do you think in the time right before he disappeared, that he had a pretty good handle on uh, this affliction? Um, I would think so. Okay. I mean, he pretty m- much knew it all, so. Okay. I'm just maybe trying to compare it maybe to like a diabetic. You get diagnosed oh, as yeah, being diabetic sure. and they have to take their insulin shots, you know, so many times a day or something. And they, yeah. of course, people can live long, fruitful lives with diabetes these days. I'm just t- asking you the, um, if he had maybe a handle on his affliction as well. I think he did. I mean, he did pretty well with it. He handled it all pretty well, especially with his medication and knowing what he was going to seize. Okay. Thank you. Was he working anywhere on maybe the year before he disappeared? Was he doing any work? Let's say legal work. Like we're, We'll get into the other part of this, but any any kind of job? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of, unless he had a job and just didn't mention it to me. Okay. And how often were you seeing him before he disappeared? How often did you communicate with him? Probably, um, like once a week or something like that, because, I mean, I got with my ex and he wasn't, he didn't care too much for my family. He didn't like my brother or anybody like that, so... I didn't get to talk to him as much as I wanted to, I didn't, and I didn't get to see him as much as I wanted to. But, I mean, I still stayed in contact with him as much as I could. Mm-hmm. And we have to remember at the time that uh, he disappeared, he was 23, so you were 18. Were you in high school when he disappeared? Or? Um, I was actually um, already graduated. I graduated when I was 17. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, we're going to move into something else now. Um, this is just maybe we're going to talk about maybe about the year before, if not more, before he uh, disappeared. You've already said that you were seeing him maybe once a week. You were talking to him. Maybe you weren't seeing him as much as you could or should, but that was um, that's what you said. Let's talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not going to use his last name. He's going to play a part in the rest of this uh, interview. His name is Mark. Uh, tell the listeners what you know about him. How did you? When did you first hear about him? And what was? How were Mark and Travis connected? Okay, Mark was actually a family friend, um, very well known 
on the Arkansas-Oklahoma borderline. Um, he was basically a big drug, drug dealer, and he was known as you don't want to basically cross paths with him if he was angry with you or anything like that. Um, and then, of course, Travis got involved with him and delivering things for him, of course, illegal substances. And, um, of course, Mark, he just was not a very friendly guy. I think I've met him, like, once. That was it. Um, like, like I said earlier, I didn't really want to be involved in that kind of situation, that kind of environment. So I try, I try to steer clear from that kind of stuff. Sure. But from what I've heard from multiple people, he just – was a very scary, angry guy, especially if you were to do him wrong. It was known to not ever do him wrong because you would end up in a horrible situation if you did. Okay. And so Travis was working for him, um, running drugs for him. You said that Travis didn't like to drive too much, but was Travis de- delivering drugs for him? What What do you now know about it now? We have to remember that this disappearance was over 12 years ago. Uh, what did you know then and what have you found out since then as far as Travis's uh, business relationship with Mark? Um, well, I didn't really know much, of course, until I started looking into like, because um, in Arkansas, you can go into Arkansas court records and see what all, you know, like if they've been arrested or, of course, all of Benton County court records. And so I'd actually looked up and found out that one of the guys that he was pulled over with when all this started um his last name was Stanfield. I cannot remember his first name for the life of me. Okay. Um, but he, but the, that was the time that Travis got caught with like the, with like the huge amount of it. And that was um, when all this whole thing with the disappearance and stuff kind of began, I guess you would say. Okay. That and, was when he was delivering stuff from Mark. Did you, once again, um, before maybe Travis got caught and we can talk about that in a second, but, before Travis got caught with this other guy doing this, did you or the rest of your family, your sisters, did you all know that what Travis was doing? I didn't. Um, I think that my dad did, though. Okay. And my dad and Travis talked about everything all the time. But, of course, I mean, we lost my dad, too, so I, I would not be able to ask him that. Okay. Your father's no. not with us anymore. He, he, no, sir. He, he's passed away since 2006. Mm-hmm. Okay. But you think that your father knew about this, but you're not sure about your mother or the, the your other sisters? Um, I'm not sure. I think my mom did mention that she knew that Travis was um, probably basically transporting stuff for Mark. Okay. And what do you think this work for Mark involved? Um, pretty much just delivering packages, I'm sure, of meth. And I'm not sure what else it would have been. Okay. Um, and getting money and that sort of thing. Okay, and and, and you said that uh, this might have been back and forth across the Oklahoma Arkansas border mm-hmm. and elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. Do you know the circumstances? Do you now know? Maybe you didn't know it back maybe two thousand five, two thousand six. But do you now know the circumstances of how Travis and this other guy got caught? Did they just happen to get pulled over, like for speeding or something, or was it a sting? Do you um, know? I know they got pulled over, um, and the records it didn't show for what, but they did get pulled over and they got and they um, got the car searched. And so they searched the car. All these drugs are in there. Uh, Travis and this other guy, I guess, uh, got uh, taken off to uh, jail. Um, do you remember Travis going to jail? Was he in jail for a long time? Did he get out he on was. bail? He, what do you, what do you remember? He was in jail for a long time. He was, um, in jail in Texarkana. Okay. So that's where he got caught. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and, and is that near you? Where were all of you living at the time? Fayetteville or somewhere else? Silent Springs. Um, my mom was living in Missouri. We were living in Silent Springs. Silence. And it's a couple hours away. Yeah. It's okay. on, um, Texarkana is on the Texas and Arkansas border. And so he's in jail, not near where you live. Mm-hmm. Okay. So he gets caught. He's in jail. Um, 
did he plead guilty to these charges or was he going to fight them? What happened? I'm pretty sure he pled guilty to them. He pled guilty. All right. Now, here's something that um, we haven't even got into the circumstance of his disappearance yet, but I think that the listeners need to understand all of this before we get into this. Was Travis asked by the police, whether it was the Salome Springs police or Fayetteville or Texas Arcana or maybe Arkansas State Police, whoever, uh, was he asked to work undercover for them to put Mark in jail? Um, he was supposed to, I'm not exactly sure what they called it. It was basically um, him working with them to try to put Mark away, trying to catch with them for them to try to catch Mark. Not exactly sure what they called it, though. Okay. With this... That's all I know is that he was just trying to work with them to catch Mark and put him behind bars. Okay. And did you, do you think, did, do you remember knowing this at the time, or is this once again something that you found out after the fact? I found out after the fact, after he went, after he went up missing. Okay. Do you think anybody else in your family maybe knew that he was working for the police and maybe just to be, you know, ask this question straight out, did Travis ever tell any of you, I guess you didn't, they, he never told you, but did he tell anybody else in your family that he was doing this to try to put Mark in jail? I think my dad and my mom were probably like the only ones that knew if anybody knew about it. So they might have asked him, being that they caught him, maybe give him a reduced sentence or something like that. Hey, come yeah, work for would... us. Do you think that this might have entailed wearing a wire or something like that, or how do you? What do you? I think? would think so. Okay, you're just not sure about that, and I can understand if you're not. Yeah. I'm. I'm sure the police would not, you know, release all these details and, and everything else anyway. I'm just I'm just trying to get to the extent of this because once again this could play a, a role in his disappearance. Mm -hmm. so we're not sure if he wore wore a wire, but at the very least, you think that Travis uh, was going to help the police once again to get a break in his in his own charges to help them put Mark in jail. Mm -hmm. Okay, and do you remember how long before he disappeared that he got caught in Texas Texarkana? Um, trying to think. I honestly cannot even recall that. Okay, do you so think it was ago. in 2005? Um, probably like 2004, 2005, I would think. Okay. Now here's but where I could this be gets... completely wrong. You, you could be. I, I'm going to probably say it was probably in 2005, given that he disappeared on February 20... 8th, 2006. I doubt it happened in the early 2006. I'm going to probably say it happened in 2005. Uh, I'm going to guess. But we can... Um, unfortunately, I was not able to find that exact date uh, for that. But you know for sure, though, that he was going to be testifying in a trial that was coming up. Mm-hmm. What can you tell it the listeners about be, that? When was it going to happen? Um, he... It was supposed to happen because he went missing in February. And then I think it was supposed to happen in March, I believe. Um, because he still has a warrant out for not showing up at the court date. And one of the detectives that he was working for even said that he was concerned about Travis's safety because he was supposed to testify in a narcotics case. So um, I'm pretty sure that the court date was set in March. Because I know Travis had told my mom that he was really scared that Mark was going to find out that he was doing this and he was supposed to testify against him. He was just scared that Mark was going to do something to him. Okay. Do you think that uh, you'd, you'd said that you believe that Travis told your parents about what was going on? Do you think that he, that could have leaked out, gotten back to Mark? Do you think? Um, I don't think so because um, my, both my mom and my dad were really, really protective of us. I mean, of course, they had their baggage with drugs and their history with drugs and stuff, but they were pretty protective of us. Okay. So I don't think that they would have said something knowing that something bad could have happened to Travis if they knew anything about it. Okay. So here's the situation, just to sum this all up. Um, Travis got into drugs after high school, and at some point uh, he met this uh, guy who just happened to be a family friend who – 
was into drug dealing, maybe the manufacturer of methamphetamines. His name's Mark. We know his last name, but we're not going to use it uh, in this conversation because he is out there. Um, and so Travis is working for him. Travis and this other guy get pulled over in Texarkana. Drugs are in the car. They get sent to jail. And Travis maybe makes some sort of deal with the prosecutors that uh, if he works for them to put Mark in jail and testifies against him, that uh, he'll get a reduced sentence, something like that. Yes. Okay. So, and this was supposed to happen in March of 2006. Of course, we know that uh, Travis disappeared before this. Um, before Travis disappeared and since then, have you ever heard about anybody threatening Travis uh, regarding what he was going to be doing in this trial? I, we haven't heard, we never heard anything about anybody threatening Travis. Okay. The last thing that um, Travis had ever said was that Mark had said that if anybody ever does him wrong, they would end up dead. So. Okay. And being that you still live, uh, let's just say in the area, we won't give out, we're not going to give out specific location, but um, do you know of anybody else connected to Mark uh, who ended up deceased or disappeared? Anything like that in all the years that you've lived in Arkansas, to your knowledge? I do not know of anybody else that's been okay. a task that he's done anything to. Okay. And do you think that this other guy who was with Travis was going to testify against uh, Mark as well? Did he Was I he offered the same sure. deal? Was he offered the same deal? I mean, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, that was the only thing I heard was that that's who Travis was with that night. Okay. And they got pulled over. All right. And you said that this guy's last name is Stanfield. Uh, do you know if he is still around town or is he in jail? Have you kept uh, track of him? Have you ever tried to look him up? I have not looked him up or anything like that. Um, and the first name did actually just pop up in my head. But um, I haven't seen him anywhere. I haven't even heard, of, heard about him from, since then. Okay. Okay. And... Once again, Travis disappeared on February 28th, 2006. And to your knowledge, uh, Mark's trial did happen in March of that year. As far as I'm aware of it, did. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to come back to that a little later. Let's just get into uh, that day, February 28th, 2006. There was a Mardi Gras big party going on in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Who was with... Uh, Travis that night, and um, we'll just go from there. Who was with him? Um, our brother-in-law was with him, and um, one of our brother-in-law's friends, and then three of Travis's friends was with them. Okay, so we have uh, your brother-in-law. His name's Steve. We're not going to use his last name. He had a friend of his whose name was John. Uh, mm -hmm. and then we have two girls and a guy. And that were with him. So a group of like about six people were all together that evening. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it should be known that Steve is uh, with one of your sisters to this day. He was, they were boyfriend, girlfriend yeah. back there in 2006. They are still together to this day in 2018. So you st see Steve once in a while. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and would you say that Steve has been the main source of the information regarding Travis's appearance as to what all went on that night? Yeah, I would say one of them just because he was there when it all happened. What? How does he describe what went on that evening between all of them when they got to Fayetteville and went, went uh, to what was going on, all these bars and everything? And I think everybody knows what usually goes on at Mardi Gras. But how does he explain sure. it? Um, well, Travis was supposed to go there with one of his, I guess she was like a girlfriend at the time, or maybe possible girlfriend, um, but she ended up bringing a different guy, so he kind of got upset about that, and so they kind of all went their separate ways, and then um, Travis was mostly hanging out with Stephen and John, I believe, and um, so basically, I mean, Stephen was just they're basically just kind of like bar hopping pretty much. Mm -hmm. So everybody's like out in the straights, streets. Uh, it's in Fayetteville, but it's maybe like New Orleans. People are out in the streets 
getting drunk, partying it up, going bar to bar. There's music going on, very crowded. Yeah. Okay. And so they're going bar to bar. And at some point, um, they kind of got split up. Like Steve and Travis went one way and the rest went another way. How, how would you explain that? I think so. I mean, I'm not exactly sure because they just, a lot of them, they, they can't remember anything from that night because most of them were kind of were pretty drunk. But um, from what I remember, or I, I, mean, I don't completely uh, trust me on this, I think it was just basically Travis and Stephen hanging out and then possibly John. Okay. And what does Steve say happened? They're at one of these bars and Travis sees somebody. Yeah, he said that um, they're at the bar and Travis was just happy and stuff. And then this um, Hispanic guy comes up to Travis and um, says something to him. Of course, Stephen doesn't know what they said, but um, he was, what was said. But he said after Travis talked to the Hispanic guy, he said that Travis's whole demeanor kind of changed, that he went from happy and all side and stuff to kind of, he kind of acted scared in, in a way. And that's when Travis was saying that he wasn't feeling very well. So he would have told him, okay, we'll go back to the truck or car or whatever they had with them. And we'll get every, I'll gather everybody up and we'll meet you there. If I could just ask you maybe a few questions uh, about what Steve said, because once again, I know that you see, see Steve once in a while. And I know this has been a topic of conversation. Of course, it's going to be. Did, has Steve ever told you that did, did Travis seem to know this guy or – from somewhere, did like does he remember if Travis saw the guy first or the other guy, this Hispanic guy saw Travis first? Do you know? I think the Hispanic guy saw him first, and Travis seemed to know him. And did Steve happen to hear the content of their conversation? No, he didn't hear anything what was said. All right. So, do you think that they went off like got away just so he wouldn't hear, or what do you? Does he ever explain that? Probably so. Okay, but he's never explicitly said that, well, he came over to the table and then Travis got up and they kind of went over to quarter, had to a corner, talked for like a minute, and then Travis came back. He's never been that that um, technical about what happened, I guess you'd say. No, he didn't. All he says is there was a Hispanic guy, Travis saw him, they had a conversation, Hispanic guy leaves, and Travis um, seems a little nervous about it. What happens next? And then um, after that, that's when Travis said that he wasn't feeling very well, that he wanted to go ahead and head home. So Stephen told him to go back to the truck or car or whatever it was that they were drove there that night. And um, Stephen said he'd go get every, gather everybody up, and they would head back to the car and then go home. So Travis is going to go back to the, to the vehicle that they used to get there. Was it a car or truck? I am not 100% positive on that one. Okay. So I'm not sure whose vehicle they took. Okay. Do you think that at any time, once again, since I know you've talked to Steve, um, did at any time does Steve think that maybe the sickness that Travis was feeling might be an epileptic, an epileptic seizure coming on? I don't think that. I don't think he, he thought anything like that. I just thought maybe he, he was surprising and Travis had too much to drink, probably, okay. if that was any of it at all. Okay. And... Do you think that Steve might have thought that maybe he's just saying that because this conversation that Travis just had with this guy, that maybe Travis wasn't sick at all and was maybe using that as an excuse just to get out of there? Is that a possibility? I I don't think so. So what you're saying is that Steve really believed that Travis was sick? I honestly, yeah, I think so. I think he probably thought he was sick or probably had too much to drink. So did... Steve give him the keys to go back so he could like lay down in the car or or not or what did he do? I don't think he did. If, um, of course, the car may be, may have been unlocked to see it too. I'm not exactly sure about that. Um, all I know is just that he just told him, "Okay, just go ahead and go back to the car, and then we'll just all meet you there." Okay. So Travis leaves. Steve's maybe goes to find uh, the rest of the group, and that would be his friend John. And then these three other people, once again, this was a girl who he Travis thought he was going to meet up with, and she ended up bringing another guy instead, which must have been for an awkward situation. Uh, how long, how much later, how much later do Steve and the rest of this group 
get back to the car? I don't think it was too long, maybe like an hour if that, maybe 30 minutes um, max. But um, so they get there and Travis wasn't there. So they waited there for a while. And then once the crowd kind of died down, and they went looking for him and didn't find him anywhere. Did Steve at that point um, have any theory as to, was he th- maybe thinking that Travis got a ride with somebody else? Has he ever told you what was going through his head? You know, as he... No, he never told, me, he, no, he never told anybody what he thought was going on. He was just like, man, this, he just thought it was kind of weird that all of a sudden Travis wasn't there. Okay, no sign of him. Um, of course, not in the car. Did, maybe I should have asked you this earlier, did Travis have a phone with him that night, a cell phone? Did any of them have cell phones that night? Not uh, not on them. Uh, Travis's was left at the house. He couldn't even, uh, he didn't bring it with him. So he couldn't have mm-hmm. called anybody like after he left there unless he went to a pay phone, which even in 2006 were getting rarer and rarer. Um, yeah. He was out with, without his phone. So even if they wanted to call him, they couldn't because he didn't have his phone. Exactly. Okay. Did anybody, uh, did they try calling home or anything to see if uh, maybe Travis got a ride home? Um, yeah, they had, Stephen had called and asked Travis was there and she said no. And then he told her what was going on. He's like, well, he's not here. He was supposed to meet us here. And that was so long ago. We walked around and we still can't find him. So they waited there. I think they waited there until like three o'clock in the morning waiting to see if he showed up, and he never showed up. And while they were uh, looking around for him, did anybody ever say that they saw Travis? No. No. And then since uh, that night, and over 12 years later, has anybody else ever come forward to say that they saw Travis that night after he left Steve at that bar? No, no one else has um, said anything about seeing him that night after leaving all right, so he kind of just poofed, right in, vanished into thin air. Yeah, just like this vanished. Uh, and this is uh, we're going to get into a very confusing part of this and how this all this paperwork uh, got messed up, which might have hindered uh, at least the initial investigation into Travis's disappearance. But mm-hmm. uh, when was a police report filed? Who finally did call the police? What happened? Maybe that next day after? I guess that would have been March first, two thousand six. Yeah. Um, my sister Keisha, she had called the Silent Springs Police Department because that's where we were living. That's where Travis was living to report him missing because I guess she thought that that's where she was supposed to report him missing was if he lived there. And then my mom had called Fayetteville because that's where he went missing and told them, hey, my son's missing. So... That's kind of where I guess all this confusion began was because both police departments were called. Did either a detective from or a, a police officer, I should say, did an officer from either Salome Springs show up or Fayetteville show up in person? Or was this something that you kind of did over the phone or they did over the phone? Did over the phone. And did it over the phone. So mm-hmm. no police officer ever came out to your house to ask any questions. Mm-hmm. No. no. Okay. And were there any searches done? Anybody organize anything? Did the police go downtown into Fayetteville to snoop around to any videos, ask to see any videos from all these stores and bars or anything? Did they do anything like that? Not until six years after the fact. Yeah, well, not until 2012. It would be a little late by then, wouldn't it? Yeah, because of course all the documents, all the documents as far as video work, gone. His dental records are gone. All that stuff's gone. What were the police in the maybe let's say the few weeks? Once again, and to your knowledge, I know they weren't speaking to you directly. They would have probably been speaking to your parents. Um, you have any idea what the police were telling your parents at the time? Well, see, that's the thing. We didn't. It was um, basically. Us, like the like the kids that were kind of taking care of this because my mom lived all the way in Missouri, like three or four hours away. Okay. And um, so, but according to my sister Keisha, like they never contacted her ever. And so she was like, "This is kind of getting weird, you know." So she, we contacted our local news station and told them, "Hey, we just want to see if you guys can help us out." And that's how we found out that for six years nothing was being done. 
All right, so you didn't. At all. So, so just to make sure I understand this, you you waited six years. You never thought it was maybe a little unusual that you didn't hear from the police at all for six years. Yeah, we were like, it's just it was kind of weird. But of course, I mean, we had all just graduated high school, so we're thinking, okay, maybe this is how it's supposed to work. They just contact you, they find something. Okay, and but. your dad didn't. Uh, I, once again, I know that he. Um, passed away, but he didn't pass away right after, in 2006, I think he passed away, when, 2012 or 2010? Um, 2010. 2010, okay. Mm -hmm. And so, he didn't contact them, see what's up, see what's up with his son, that. and anything? No, he, my dad honestly was probably too wrapped up in his drugs and stuff, so. Okay, so he had his own set of issues going on. Mm -hmm. So this paperwork, uh, it was Salome Springs versus Fayetteville. What did you personally think was going on? You thought that Salome Springs was looking into this or did you think that Fayetteville was in charge of this? I thought Salome was because um, I didn't know for the longest time that my mom had contacted Fayetteville. Um, I didn't know that until six years later, whenever um, we'd contacted 4029 see if they could help us, you know, get a story out there. And then that's when I find out that my mother had contacted Fayetteville. So I thought Salem was working on the case. And what you found out, what did, when you eventually did get to talk to these police departments, let's go with Salem Springs first in 2012, what did they tell you? Um, they said that they had transferred um, the case to Fayetteville since Fayetteville is where he went missing. And then um, Fayetteville said that they didn't get any of that paperwork. So that's kind of, I guess, where it got lost. Because Salem was saying, well, we sent all this stuff over to Fayetteville because we went missing in Fayetteville. And Fayetteville was like, well, we never got any of that documentation. Did yeah. either Salome Springs or Fayetteville, since 2012, when you finally got back into this, you got the media involved, did you ever, have you ever personally seen those uh, missing persons report that were originally called in in 2006. Um, yes, they actually um, had both, um, well, Siloam had actually printed off everything, of course, but that they were able to, and of course, they blacked out a lot of the stuff. And um, we it actually showed where um, Keisha had called Siloam to, to reporting Travis missing. And then, of course, in that documentation, it also states that my mother called um, Fayetteville. Okay. And have you ever seen any uh, documentation from Fayetteville from 2006? Um, just emails, like from, uh, back and forth from the detective working on it in Salome and then the detective working on it in Fayetteville. Okay. But you said that your mother called Fayetteville. Uh, Fayetteville did not take a missing persons report then? Um, I'm not positive because we did not get any paperwork about Fayetteville taking it. Never. And so we had this confusion. You think one thing's going on and really nothing is going on. Exactly. Is it your impression that once Travis's disappearance was called in, whether to Fayetteville or Salome Springs, that neither the police department did anything? Yeah, I to my knowledge, nothing was really being done at all, or else um, video surveillances would have been checked, dental records would have been checked. Well, that had to have, uh, I mean, if the police aren't going to look into this, then it's no wonder that this is still an unsolved case over 12, 12 years later. Yeah, we were pretty livid about the situation, too. So then, then can I take it for granted? Now, see, this is where it, you know, it gets maybe a little even more confusing to me is that if Travis was supposed to testify in court against Mark a few weeks after he disappeared, um, the police didn't come looking for Travis and say, hey, you're supposed to come down here and testify. He didn't show up at mm -hmm. your house or didn't call your mother, who didn't try calling his phone. Did they not try to look for him at all, being that he was supposed to be testifying in this case? Um, I don't think that they did, or else, or else they would have, because they had his address and everything, and 
Keisha and Shannon, because he was living with um, my sister, and they said they never said anything about the police coming by looking for him. Okay, now I'm so all right. Let's go back then to that. Um, when it comes to Travis testifying in this case against Mark, did any policeman, a detective, or anybody ever show up? Ever talk to your parents? Ever talk to anybody else in your family about Travis testifying? No. So the only way you know that Travis was supposed to be testifying is from Travis himself. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I need to ask you, and I have to ask these questions. Do you think, th- is there something in there that doesn't seem quite right to you, Sonia? Um, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm glad you said yes, because it seems a little strange to me, too, that if if Travis was going to be a cornerstone of this case against Mark, then the police would want, you know, I know it's technically the district attorney, but it's usually some police officer that goes and picks a witness up at their house and drives them to the courthouse, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. That it's just strange to me that nobody ever called or showed up at anybody's house and said, where's Travis? I'm supposed to pick him up today. And you say, well, you know, he disappeared two weeks ago. That, to your knowledge, that never happened. To my knowledge, none of it did. Okay. And to you, you, I know, of course, your sisters. Of course, you have your brother-in-law, Steve, who was there. Of course, your father, who is now deceased. But none of them have ever said that to you personally either. No. Okay. Yeah, there's something, yeah, there's something about this that just uh, seems a little weird uh, about this. Because if... Thinking- yeah, I'm thinking if she should have had some type of protection. Well, well, he should have. And, uh, you know, I'm not here, you know, I want to find out what happened to Travis. And all the listeners know this, but they also know that I'm usually fairly obvious. I'm going to tell you, Son, you just, I'm wondering if he was really going to testify against Mark at all. Mm-hmm. Okay. I know that's what he was saying. Um, but being that no DA, no prosecutor, they don't like it when um, witnesses don't show up. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I and I realize that you know he does have you know looking at does he have a failure to appear in court on charges of being an accomplice to this day? Um, yeah, he's like from when he's supposed to go to court that day to testify against the Mark. He has a warrant out for his arrest right now for not showing up. All right, is that? Okay, just to be clear, is that uh, a warrant because he didn't show up for his own case on the charges that he himself uh, had against him, or is that actually for the case in which it was going to be against Mark? Um, I'm not sure. This is failure to appear. I'm guessing that might be for his own case and not for Mark's. Just an okay. opinion. Just an opinion. Okay, so there's, I, and I'm sure the listeners who probably some are lawyers and things, they're going to probably be able to give a lot of feedback about, about what the intricacies of. I've never been a lawyer. I've never been asked to testify in court. There's just something about this that doesn't doesn't quite seem right uh, regarding all mm-hmm. of this. Um, and you should know that um, I had another case where. Uh, a witness in a court case had already testified and she was due to testify again and she disappeared in that time. She already given the deposition, but then I think that she was going to be going into court and actually sit in the court under oath. She disappeared right before that. And I know in that case, the, the, the DA and all these people trying to file this you know, this charges against this big company went looking for her. Yeah. Doesn't sound like that happened in Travis's case. So but, when my um the paperwork that Solomon had given us, um there were a few emails in there how one of the detectives were saying how they were concerned about Travis's safety because he's a witness in one of the cases that they're working on. Okay. All right. Okay. Um it just seems like something that's just maybe uh a little foggy right now, maybe not as clear cut um, as it may appear to be. Okay, so maybe Travis was doing this. Um, let's just talk about that case. Do you believe that this this case against Mark actually was eventually? Did that trial happen? 
Uh, I honestly am not sure if it ever happened or not. I was not told that it did, and I wasn't told that it didn't. Uh, but you do believe that Mark has been in jail for a while now. He's been in jail for something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was in jail for something and just recently got out, like, maybe like a year or two ago. Okay. And um, and anything that you've ever heard about Mark being in jail over the years, has, has uh, Travis's name ever come up? It has not. Um, have you, since you started getting back into this, uh, especially with this 2012 uh, coverage that you got and since then, and now we know who police, which police department, have you ever had a chance to talk uh, to any the DA or prosecutor, anybody like that who might have been responsible, who might have had Travis on their docket to testify? Have you ever looked into that? I have not. I've not talked to any DA or prosecuting attorney or anything like that. I've just okay. talked to, the, to uh, the detectives. Since being that, once again, now you know who the police are and, the, the, and who is responsible for Travis's disappearance now? Who's responsible for or who is... Um, Which police like, department? Um, Siloam. Siloam Springs. And have they at any time ever told you that they think that Travis disappeared because he was due to testify against Mark? They have not told us that, but um, they themselves even said that Mark isn't a good guy because they know him okay. firsthand. All right. Um, let's move on to something else, maybe another uh, avenue that we you know, we have to look at. Um, and that is these this group, these two girls and this guy who showed up um, that night. Uh, and Travis had, do you know what kind, what Travis was trying to go out with one of these girls? I mean, I'm guessing she was in her early 20s as well. And she brought along mm -hmm. uh, another guy. Can you tell, do you know anything more about that? This seems kind of a strange situation. Have you ever considered the idea that maybe Travis disappeared because of his interest in this other girl, and then maybe this other guy got ticked um, off or something? I'm not sure. Um, from what I was told was that Travis and um, Miss Brandy were supposed to go to this Marty girl together, mm -hmm. and then she ends up bringing some other guy for her date. And that kind of just made Travis mad because him and Brandy were supposed to go together. Okay. How did you find out about that? Um, I think my mom had told me that because Travis had mentioned it to my mom. Okay, well, how could he have mentioned it to her if he, that happened on the same night that he disappeared and he didn't have his phone? Or it may have been, well, I think it was her. I don't know. But it may have been Stephen Stephen telling my mom. Okay. But Maybe I know Stephen my mom and my mom, I heard it from my mom. Okay, I heard it from her. Great. Okay, let's... um. Uh, talk about once again let's go back to steve for a little bit and once again i know that he's your your uh, brother-in-law and you know you, you continue to know him very well uh has he if he lives in the area has he ever seen this hispanic guy again he hasn't he hasn't seen him again since that night has he ever given you any impressions as to what he thinks did he does he ever lean did it look like it was a friend of travis's uh, frankly, could it have been an undercover cop? Did Steve think that maybe these guys, that maybe it was a, like a drug dealer friend of Travis's? Has he ever, Steve, if you can say, has Steve ever offered up uh, an opinion on who he thinks that guy might have been? Um, I don't, not to me, he has, but he just, it was kind of like an awkward situation, just the way Travis started acting after this has been a guy walked off. Did you know? Did Travis say anything after he came back? You know, no, he didn't. That that was just after after that. Travis was just saying that he would didn't feel very well. So okay. Um, can you personally think? And I once again, I know that you were five years difference, and you were still in high school or had just graduated. And of course, Travis was out doing uh, his own thing, and some of it is illegal. And you were trying to, you know, keep all of that at arm's length. Can you think of any of Travis's friends back in 2005 into 2006 who were Hispanic? 
Not that I can think of. You know, I'm sure I mean, he had so many friends that I don't even know who they. Like, I don't even know how. I never even knew half of his friends. Okay. Has anybody um, since once again since 2012, let's say since um, this media coverage finally got you know happened and all this got sorted out, has anybody able been able to ever give you an opinion? on who this Hispanic guy might have been. You don't have to give any names, but has anybody who knew Travis back then come to you or anybody in your family and said, you know what, I think it might be this guy? No, nobody said anything about any names who they think it might be or anything. So it was just... That's uh kind of so weird about it. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's move on to... Uh, this, this other guy who got caught with Travis, uh, maybe I asked you this before. I'm going to ask you again. Have you kept tabs on this guy? Do you know anything about him? Uh, is he still alive? Um, have you, have you ever tried to look him up maybe to get any clue as to might, what, what might have happened to Travis? I haven't, because I don't even know who the guy is. Okay. So I wouldn't even know what to, what the guy looks like or anything. All right, but you just know you know his last name and that's it. I know his first name too now because it came okay. in my head a while back ago. Okay. Well, I would suggest you might want to do that. In fact, I, I'm sure that um, just by doing this interview, we could probably pick out some things that I, I could probably uh, set you you know on the right path if you you know you want to mm -hmm. clear up some of these things for sure. Sonia, I'd be glad to do that for you. Uh, off the air, not in this interview. Uh, I'll do that privately for you. Okay. Um. So he, these two got caught. Do you know if Travis and this other guy were friends? Do you do you think that you know they were close, or were they just two guys doing a job? I think they were friends, honestly, because um, I because the last name I know the last name because I. Mm -hmm. I've heard Travis mention the last name before. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty sure he was friends with them. Once again, since 2006, since his disappearance, have any of Travis's friends, whether they were involved in what he was doing or not, did have any of them come up to you and offered their opinions, any insight, anything that they've heard regarding Travis's disappearance? No, the only one who's ever even mentioned anything with Stephen. I mean, um, just Stephen, he was like, he was just saying, it was just kind of weird how that Hispanic guy just comes up to him and then all of a sudden Travis's whole demeanor changes. So, I mean, Stephen thinks something, something that maybe one of Mark, like Mark may have sent this Hispanic guy to try to deter Travis or scare him in some, in some way after he went missing. He was like, I should have walked with him to the car because, you know, uh -huh. he's like, hey, because he's like, how do how do I know that Mark didn't send this guy up here? Right. But no one else from that night has even mentioned anything, really. Okay. Uh, maybe just to give, you know, I've never been to Fayetteville. Uh, this will be, I think, this is the, at least the fourth case that I've covered uh, in the state of Arkansas. Uh, mm -hmm. What is downtown Fayetteville like? Um, could there have been a situation where Travis is walking by himself and maybe fell into a river? Is there a river that goes through Fayetteville? Any, any? Oh no, there's no rivers through downtown Fayetteville. It's all buildings and bars and things like that. All right, so there's no way he could have fallen into a body of water and drowned, or oh no. All right, because that's if you don't know, that happens quite a bit in a lot of disappearance oh, cases. Yeah. That you know, eventually many bodies are found and in rivers and it usually has to do with drugs or drinking, you know, alcohol, something like that, mm -hmm. that you don't, that couldn't have happened in Travis's case. No, no. All right. Now there is uh, another, um, part of this that was somebody, I, I just had it in my notes from the time that we talked before. Um, a woman called saying that Travis better not call her or she'd kill him. Do you have any, what, yeah. what is that? What story is that? Um, this number had called my sister Keisha and she didn't recognize the number. So she answered it. And, and the lady said, tell Travis to stop calling her or I'll kill him. 
So, okay. and then she was like, excuse me? And then, of course, the lady hung up. When did, when did this happen? How close do you think to Travis's disappearance did this happen? Um, it was probably a couple months after. A couple months after Travis disappeared? He went missing. Mm-hmm. And a woman's ca- calling... Um, your sister to say for Travis to stop calling her, even though Travis has disappeared for a couple months before yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Any idea who that might have been? Do your sister have any idea who that might have been? No, nobody has any any idea because the phone that she called from, um, I forget, it was either like a pay phone thing or one of those pay as you go phones. Well, I could see if maybe this call was made before he disappeared, but it's so you're yeah. saying it was a couple months afterwards. So maybe I'm in sure. maybe in May of 2006. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was a couple months after. Was Travis? I mean, like you said, he tried to get with this one girl who ended up showing up, but she showed up with another guy. Um, do you think that there were any other women in Travis's life before he disappeared? Not that I can think of. I don't think there was really. Okay. Because relationships, if you don't know, play a large part in a lot of the disappearance that I covered. Dr- drugs do too, but number one is relationships. You know, mm-hmm. people being interested in each other and this girl won't go out with this guy and he wants to do something to her. Um, that pops up a lot. And so that's why I'm asking here. You know, he has this one girl that he wants to meet for Mardi Gras. She comes up with another guy. And then a couple months later, this if we're to believe that if it's not a crank call, somebody's calling your sister telling, talking about Travis and it has to do with another girl. Yeah. Very strange. Very, very strange. Okay. Um, what's this been like for you? I mean, I know that probably when it, he disappeared in 2006, you were only 18 years old, but it's been 12 years now. I guess you're, maybe 30 now. Um, have you kind of taken this over now for your family? And I mean, wh- how long have you been working on this and what's this all been like? I know your father's passed away, but uh, for the, your sisters and of course for your mother. Um, well, like I have my days. Some days I just break down. And I just am so upset. I just cry. And there are some days where I'm just angry. I'm just, you know, I'm just like, why was nothing being done? But, I mean, they're working on it now. Like, I have, I usually have, like, a monthly meeting with the detectives now working on, who's working on Travis's case. But, I mean, it's really hard on us. I mean, it definitely takes a toll on us. It's, um, especially, like, in February, we do, like, a balloon release every year. So, in the month of February, I really don't have a life because I'm so busy getting all this stuff together. Um so like you said, I am the one who's basically taken the lead in this whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know why. I was just like basically the one who was picked to take the lead in it all. Mm-hmm. Um, when we did all, all of our stories for 4029, I was the main person they interviewed. It's, I mean, it's really, really hard. I mean, because it's been 12 years and we don't know anything. We don't know where he's at. We don't know if he's dead. We don't know if he's alive. I mean, we know in our hearts that he is most likely dead, but what we want is for him to be found. We want, he, he deserves a proper burial. Nobody deserves to be killed or dead and just thrown somewhere. He deserves a proper burial. He deserves to be found. Our family deserves a closure. And like all these people say, oh, he was on drugs. It doesn't matter. It does matter. Of course I mean, it does. Age, yeah. race, gender should have nothing to do, should not affect any person's missing case at all. all. Right. Absolutely. I mean, like I've told, like I've told um, everybody, missing adults matter. It doesn't matter if this person is 25 or 44. If they go missing, they deserve the same respect, the same process as anybody else, as a pregnant woman. It shouldn't matter if it they were on drugs, if they were 35, if they were 23, they deserve the same respect, the same everything that any other person deserves. Right. I mean, the, it's, it's just really hard sometimes. I mean, I'll just be having a normal day 
and all of a sudden I just break down crying. It's more of like a, I guess, a depressive view basically is what it does. I hear that a lot, Sonia. You aren't alone. You are not alone at all. You know, most of the people who are guests on Unfound are, I think, mothers of disappeared children are probably the, the people who appear on Unfound the most. And then siblings like yourself are probably number two. Yeah. And it affects all of these people the same. You know, you, yeah, you don't have answers. You don't know what happened. Uh, you don't get a lot of answers from the police. And there are days when there are good days and then there are bad days. Mm-hmm. You know, just depending on how it hits you. I hear it a lot. Yeah, the good thing, though. Yeah, like living in Arkansas, we have um, our attorney general. She does this missing persons event every single year. Um, and all these people, all these like families in Arkansas gather. And usually it's in Little Rock. And we have this luncheon thing. And we go up there to update any information that we have on that person or on the family members, anything like that. Or if they don't have our DNA on file, we give them our DNA. And then um, the um, state attorney actually goes up and recognizes each and every missing person in the state of Arkansas. Uh And she um, gives us like this plaque thing. And then throughout this whole process, I've actually gotten a privilege to meet and become close with um, Colleen Nick, who um, Morgan Nick was her daughter that went missing several years ago. But so... I've gotten really close with her, and she's she's actually been like a rock for me through this whole thing. She's an amazing, amazing woman. Okay, good, good. How's uh, your is? Does your mother still live in Missouri, or is she back in Arkansas? Um, she still lives in Missouri. She lives okay. like three hours away, I believe. Okay. Do you and she talk about Travis often? Um. Yeah, we do. She, she, I think takes it the hardest. I mean, she's on depression medication and stuff because of it, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, she's the one that takes it harder than any of us because, I mean, that is her only son. Of course. Of course. And um, her, my mom and Travis were super, super close. How about your sisters? Are they the same way? Would you say that the way you've expressed what you're going through, do you think it's uh, the same for them? Oh, yeah. All of us are just, we all have our days. Like at the balloon release, we all cry. It's just, it's one of those things that um, we talk about it a lot of the times. And then once we start talking about it, you know, we start regretting, you know, all the things we could have done with Travis, all the things we should have done with Travis. You know, it's, we're like, we'll, it's one of those things we're like, we could have been a better sister. It's the what if. Right. Why didn't I do this? What if I would have done this? Why couldn't I have I've been a better sister? So that's, that is the kind of things that always kind of go through our mind whenever we talk about them. Okay. Do you have a Facebook page or anything like that uh, that my listeners I, can go to? I do. Um, it is uh, Missing Travis Dwayne Robertson. Um, okay. I can actually share it on your page if, if you want me to. I can. Um, I will be sharing that page. That is- well, by the time that the listeners hear this, we, uh, the listeners should know that we are doing this uh, interview on May 6th. 2018 and of course the episode will come out uh five days from now but i can assure you that my listeners i will link to it they will have seen it by the time we're talking okay but for people who didn't see it now they know yeah i can um share that his page with you i mean okay and my sister set up a page too it's one of the ones where he has to add a friend which that's not the correct one it's the one that I set up. It's one of the actual pages where you just click like. That is his actual page. Okay. And that's the one if um, I have any updates, which we haven't really had any updates in a while, that is the page I post all the updates on. Okay. Or if there's any, or if there's any other missing people that get shared, I share that on Travis's page as well. Okay. Great. I will make sure that all my listeners know about it, and I will link to it as well. Awesome. Um, Sonia? Any final words uh, before we conclude this interview? Um, just never give up hope. That's the thing that keeps me, that keeps me going is the hope. I mean, sorry, I'm kind of getting teary eyed, but um, just the prayers. That's all that we need. 
the prayers and the shares. Uh, Sonia, I, I want to tell you that I want to continue to work with you. I think there's some uh, things that we're going to talk about off the air that okay. I can help you with as far as setting you in a direction. There just seems to me to be there's some things uh, that maybe we should know after all these years, and I'm going to give you some recommendations on how to get those answers to kind of fill in some of the fill in these blanks that I think might have popped up in this interview. I want to continue to work with you on this after this episode airs, okay? Okay. Uh, uh, this will be things just between us. Nobody else will know about it uh, because I think I can really help you uh, with some of this. And I want to appreciate okay. I appreciate you deeply appreciate you being on this episode of Unfound. Well, thank you for having me. You're welcome. And that was my interview with Sonia Robertson, youngest sister of Travis Robertson. I thank her for joining me and all of you on this episode. All of you know my desire to use full names when talking about suspects. In this case, I honored Sonia's wishes to only use Mark's first name. Yes, I know his last name. But he's still out there and Sonia and her family fear what he might do if his entire name is mentioned in regards to Travis's disappearance. So we left his last name out of this interview. I'll talk more about him in a moment. I think you, the listeners, can see why this episode is called Filling in the Blanks. Because although we seem to have a complete story, Travis goes to Mardi Gras with friends. He runs into a guy he knows. After that, he says he's sick and goes back to the car. He disappears. When we really get down into the details, the story seems to have a lot of empty spaces. How long did Travis and this guy talk? Did the guy walk up to him or did Travis go over to him? Why didn't Steve hear the content of the conversation? If Steve couldn't, did he not ask Travis who that guy was? I'm not saying there aren't answers to these questions. Surely there are. What I'm saying is if this is all that Steve has offered from that conversation since 2006, then he needs to be more forthcoming about those details, which I believe he should still remember. Because every little detail helps. As for the drug trafficker Mark, this is another part of the case where it seems like it's a complete story. Travis worked for Mark, Travis got caught, Travis agreed to testify against Mark, then Travis disappeared. Once again, though, once you really analyze that story, empty spaces appear again. Why didn't the police or the prosecutor come looking for Travis on the day he was supposed to testify? If Travis was testifying against Mark... Why would he tell anybody, especially his parents, who Sonia admitted were friends with Mark? Family friend is how I think she put it. Not to mention that even me knowing Mark's last name has not helped me discover any information about his criminal history, which is strange. And I could find no information about a trial where Travis was supposed to testify, at least anything that was in a major newspaper at the time. On the Unfound Live show a couple days ago, I made the comparison to Lola Catherine Fry's case, one we covered.